comments or correspondence? Any executive committee comments? Is there a motion to approve the minutes of January 16th? Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? meeting finally today about how to become a Washington Central Unified Union School Board I'm member. I put that out today and put a detailed fact sheet on the website and put an announcement out through Front Porch Forum. No, I just did a, I actually typed it. Oh, typed it real quick. <laughs> and uh, sent it to the town clerks or a couple questions, but nothing that's. Well, it depends on what happens on the 19th. If the recommendation we talked about that the executive committee made last meeting in the minutes was to have it be on April 2nd. So if that's the case, then they're due February 28th. And that's what I said in there, but it depends on the, depends on what happens on the 19th. Yeah, that. Uh, well, there's, there's, uh, I mean, there's just some things we're trying to organize around those different art warnings, but we can do that in the full board as well as here. I think that might actually be the better place. I brought copies of the warning for, third, for all 35. Look at that. I didn't talk about that in the 46 discussion. I talked with Chris Leopold for a while today, just going down through every article, making sure. I understood what there was. There's probably a reversal that I'm going to suggest that a resident may want to suggest to the moderator of changes in the order of these articles. Because how do you, is a moderator line up? So you would talk to Paul. I did, yeah, I haven't, che I haven't checked back with So him. I was going to ask you if you can oh, yeah, check sure. back okay. with him. I should do that, yeah. I don't know if he's planning on it or not. So. <laughs> definitely Paul should, definitely should contact him. Paul Costello? Uh, no, no, it's uh, Paul Hamlin. He, uh, okay, that'd be uh, awesome. For the Worcester um, town meeting he does every year. Oh, and actually, he's somebody good at it. So, yeah. He's pretty cute. Volunteering his <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. Oh, yeah. He's really nice. Yeah. As long as yeah, it brings you, Mimi, I, that's too. That's what I was going to ask you tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll bring Mimi. I was going to ask you tonight if you could check in with him. Yeah. I will, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because we need him there.
schedule? Uh, there is a <laughs> somewhere. There's a schedule. Um, yeah, on the website there was of uh, what we were thinking in March, uh, which would be the week. Because I believe the, there's a carousel for reorganization, which will need to happen on the 27th. Not a carousel for reorganization. Washington. You need that to keep operation if the merger goes through, keeps on track. You need it either way. You've got to have that. Because this is you're the this is just like the local board. It's the executive committee is a representative of the operational for the SU. That's why we had the board orders. We need you guys to help us pay. Authorize the payment. Of so, does the executive committee have? A, do we set the meetings every every month? To well, what usually, day works usually, best, or is no? We usually have it the Wednesday before. It's usually been the third or fourth Wednesday. We've been alternating, so we found that the executive committee on the same night as a carousel usually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We have planned. We just we were, so the third or the fourth. Yeah. Okay. If there's no carousel meeting, it's the fourth week, okay. fourth Wednesday. If there is a carousel meeting on the fourth Wednesday, then we do it on the third Wednesday. So okay. But right now, Matthew and I were screwed on agendas. But the work we need of the executive committee is the board orders. Willing to do other, at least I'm willing to do other. But that's the work we need to have done. Yeah, no, that's, that's okay. Okay, well, without objection or by consensus, we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Good meeting. Yeah, we'll try to see if we can get the next one to be in. Some of them still are like.
There are, of course, uh, at least two initiatives underway to try to either uh, overturn that order or change the terms of that order. Uh, one example is that the uh, House, I believe, uh, last week uh, passed, approved a bill uh, which would postpone uh, the deadlines uh, that were set in Acts 46 and 49 for Washington Central by a year. So essentially, we, if that uh, is taken up in the Senate and is uh, passed in the Senate and signed by the governor, uh, in that scenario, uh, we would not be required to merge until July 1st of 2020 uh, instead of July 1st of 2019, which is uh, what the law says currently. Uh, so that's one initiative that's underway. The second, of course, is the legal action that I believe four of our six uh, school boards have uh, endorsed or signed on to. Um, and my understanding is that there's a hearing uh, in that uh, legal proceeding on Friday of this week. Uh, but essentially, unless and until the legislature uh, and the governor take action or uh, a judge orders a stay or an injunction or rules uh, on the constitutionality or legality of the law or the process, uh, we basically are, you know, the order we are under is, um, you know, has the force of law for the moment. So there is an organizational meeting scheduled. I think everyone should be aware, I hope, for next Tuesday evening. Uh, it's a floor meeting. Um, and I'll turn it over to Bill to kind of share uh, his thoughts and the attorney's uh, advice and recommendations regarding that meeting. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Uh, there it goes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to take a few minutes just to kind of go down through the items on the warning. We haven't had a chance to do that, so I handed everyone a copy of the warning for next Tuesday night. I spent about an hour this afternoon with Chris Leopold, uh, talking with him about what each item means and what are the different ramifications determined by the way the electorate would choose to go. This is a floor meeting, like if we're a town meeting day floor. So there's no Australian ballots. Whoever shows up that are legal voters are there. Um, are there will determine the outcome of each question. Adrian. So I'm going to get into that as I go through this. Um, I've been working with the five town clerks. You have awesome town clerks in your towns. They've been extremely helpful, extremely patient, and willing to ask detailed questions to get it right. And they know that they probably have two or three elections to run this year or into next year. Um, and I must say, they've just been really flexible. Well, they understand it's a lot more work than they would usually have on their plate. So if you get a chance to see any of them, please thank them. I've been trying to do it as much as I can. Um, they've been really, really helpful. Um, so the Secretary of Education has appointed me to be the representative from the Agency of Education. That's happened in other forming districts. So the secretary, we have to get the secretary scheduled as secretary of the year. So I have authorization through a letter to be the representative for the Agency of Education. So as Adrian said, who's, the, who's running the meeting, I'm actually convening the meeting up through the first article. So I will, even though I'm, I don't need to be a registered voter of any of the five towns, and the secretary would be if they were here, um, but I will be doing that. The first, the first item is about um, electing a temporary moderator. And you say, why is it temporary? You may not be able to get the moderator that we wanted for the year. Down in the next article for all officers of the district, which you need a moderator for the meeting. So we've talked to one moderator. We're going to try to confirm that, uh, that they're available to be here that night and to run the meeting and uh, would like to do that work. And I'm just going to go through these. If I go over an article, I'm going to pause for like 15 seconds. If you say I'm going too fast, stop it because you want to think. If you're going to, I'm not sure if you have a question, slow me down. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't want to take questions by our because I think that's the best way to do it. The next one is to it. Um, all school district, school boards are required under statute to follow Robert's rules, but for school district, 
school districts meetings, they have to elect what court rules of order they're going to use. And there are two main ones, and I'm sure others around this table can help me with others, but the two that I remember are Robert's Rules of Order and the Mason's Rules of Order. And the Mason's Rules of Order are used more for legislative bodies, like the legislature runs on that. So the recommendation is Robert's Rules of Order. So there needs to be, the electorate needs to say for this annual meeting all substantial, what are the rules of order we're using? It's a one-time piece. Okay. Uh, number three, to elect the following officers for the district among qualified voters, so they must be a voter, to be the moderator, the clerk, and the treasurer. We know that Mary Ormsby, she's been the clerk and the treasurer for Washington Central, for U32, and for Calus. She's willing to continue to do that work in this role for the Unified Union District. That doesn't mean others can't uh, be nominated to have a vote for. But we know we have at least one person. Uh, we're hoping, uh, as I said, we've talked to a moderator of one of your towns, and we're hoping that they're willing to be part of this as well. The reason I'm not saying the name is because I want to confirm it one more time, and so I don't want to put it out here in public. It's not fair to the person. Um, but Mary has been very open, like I'm willing to keep doing the work of being the clerk and the treasurer. Um, four, five, and six kind of go together. So four is about when's the date for the annual meeting this year and in subsequent years. Five and six, five is about Australian ballot for the budget and six is about the district board by Australian ballot. And I'm gonna to suggest to one of you that at this meeting you ask the moderator to change the order of these three items. That, you, that the floor determines are we using Australian ballot for all items? Or are we using it for some items of the election? In other words, do you need a floor meeting? Because that may change the date that you may, the electorate may want to have the school district meeting if it were to be a district meeting where everyone comes. If it's Australian ballot, my recommendation to you and I would hope you'd recommend this to the electorate, is to use town meeting day as the annual school district meeting. Um, so I think that it would help the meeting, and I didn't see this when this came out, really this just came from a conversation today with Chris Leopold, that hey, if you're gonna have some, because we, in the Articles of Agreement Committee, we've been talking a little bit about floor, votes, or, um, anybody that can help me with the other type of electoral matter. Representational um, election, uh, uh, representational annual meeting, annual meeting, you would have a different annual date. And so it may be a Saturday, it may not, because town meeting you'd be conflicting with towns, the towns town meeting. So I would, urge someone, and I'll talk to a couple of you individually that know you're going to be there that night, to ask the moderator to, re to move four to after five and six. Okay? I believe that that would be better because then you know, if it's Australian ballot, you may say, hey, and that could be changed through the Articles of Agreement later on. And you could change that in the town meeting later on. So you don't feel like this is setting stone forever, but it is asking you right now. Um, yes, Ruben. Yeah. Make sure people can hear. All of these parliamentary parliamentary proceedings are these for the transitional board or for the ongoing Union School District? They're for the ongoing Union School District until, or no, I should say until, if an Articles of Agreement were passed by the electorate, or a different way as in our 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 articles agreement that have been handed to us. Because if you look at Article 14, there's three different ways that articles can be changed. Change something. If it were going to change a vote methodology, it would probably have to be done by the electorate. 
So a follow-up question, and this may be a little premature because if we decide that we don't have to have an in-person meeting, then it doesn't really matter, but um, where would that in-person meeting happen? Well, that depends on attendance. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Steve himself to help me with my numbers here, but I believe the auditorium can hold about 440 people. That I actually know because I want to make sure for the annual meeting because that's where this district organization will be, we're having there. The gym's about 1,000, Stephen? Yeah. yeah. That's the biggest place we've got. You know, the next biggest place we've got in our town, not in our towns, it's in Montpelier, is the Civic Center at the bottom of the hill. So then, any questions on, any more questions on four, five, or six? Okay. Uh, I'm assuming we're all set, Ruben. We all set? Yeah. No, I understand, I understand. Uh, so seven and eight, seven is to determine and approve compensation to pay the officers. For the moderator, there's usually not any compensation, but for the clerk and the treasurer, there is, especially. The clerk does work as making sure the school district meeting minutes and warnings are taken care of and elections. They're the ones that are in charge of making sure the election runs for the unified union district. The other work, since it's usually the same person, and that's been the history in Washington Central, the treasurer is every two weeks doing works to review the board orders and make sure the checks are signed. So there's quite a bit of work there. Uh, Lori's been running some figures I don't have with me tonight on what it is for time and the compensation that we've had on that, but we'll have that for Tuesday night for you to hand to you folks about what we should have seen. The item eight to determine and approve compensation for the district board members I did a quick email out to merge districts and uh, school districts that aren't necessarily merged, but are city districts like Montpelier. Um, didn't actually ask Montpelier, but Springfield, Burlington, South Burlington, and so on. And it seems about the average compensation for a district member is $1,000. I don't know if Laura, if you've heard anything different through the SBA. Yeah, it's about $1,000. Nine, this allows number nine and number 10 and 11 are a little bit to talk about here. Number nine allows for bills to be paid for the new unified union district before July 1st. So it, and it even allows them to be paid before there's an approved budget uh, because it's gonna be coming from the 2020 budget, not this year's budget. And one of the discussions the executive committee, I think we had, but I may be wrong because I know Lori and I had this conversation, or it's a question I've heard, could this be paid for out of the local districts? And one of the issues with that is that the voters have given you as boards authority to use the approved, audited fund balance for the organization that you sit on as a local board. They, so for example, they've given the Calus board the authorization for the Calus School District. But they haven't given the Calus board the authorization for the Unified District. And it's a different entity. So there is an authorization for the local boards to pay for the new work of the Unified Union District ahead of time to either give money to do it or to approve bills. And the only place to do that is through voters is the way uh, that this has been, that this is why this question's here. It's for the voters to authorize the new union districts to pay the bills before July 1st, because otherwise we wouldn't be paying the bills until we had an approved, we were into the this FY20 school year with a, we could have an approved or not approved budget, but
Um, so looking at number uh, nine, it says to establish provisions for the payment of any expense. Uh, who, is, who is it that would establish the provision? The electorate at the meeting? Yeah. And would they have to come up with a, a specific provision? No, they just need to say we authorize the payment of bills. Okay, so there needs to be another mechanism there or something, I, I would think, because it's not giving a payment, well, I would authorize paying bills out of each Montoya's budget. Um, but, you know, just in terms of a proportionality or something, yeah. in terms of a provision, I would think. Yeah. So, just... I'll, I'll I can ask Chris. Okay. I got it. Why not make a note of that? The other part on that, and this goes into 10, which is to authorize the district to borrow money on a show, you know, pending receipt of payments from the state fund that to pay those bills. And this goes to what I was talking about earlier. Could the, there's been some talk about can we use general fund balance or use our budgets, especially the Washington Central budget, can we use that to pay some of the bills? And talking with Chris Leopold, he said that at least he thinks there needs to be a authorization from the Secretary of Education, but he felt more comfortable if we actually had authorization from the voters to do that. We don't have that question on the morning. So we need to borrow money to pay, it would be a short-term loan, to pay it back in June to pay the bills of the, super, of the new unified union. You ask what bills. Well, we got to run an election. We got to pay for all the ballots and the ballot machines. Laura, I think we said that was like four or five thousand dollars, just for that one. Yeah, to for one, and we're going to three elections. Yeah, we have the legal expenses we've been paying for right now out of Washington Central uh, for Chris Leopold and the executive committee authorized that to do that. But we're pretty much we've run almost we've run through that money. Um, you know, there's going to be printing costs for ballots. Uh, there'll be other expenses where fees for putting together um, tax, ID, tax IDs, where we've actually just started that this week, uh, and different federal IDs that we need, forms that need to go in. So we're, we've got that list put together and we've started doing that work of creating a new organization. So there'll be some of that as well. Um, I haven't, we haven't really come up with many other fees at this point, but we're trying to keep it as small as possible, frankly. But <coughs> can you just clarify what you meant when you said it wasn't warned? I, I mean, it is. It isn't. So it isn't warned to authorize. It's warned to have the borrowing. It's not warned to say have the Washington Central Super, the voters approve the use of Washington Central Supervisory Union money to pay for those expenses. Okay. That's not warranted. Okay. So, and Chris feels, he said, I think you could do it with a letter from the Secretary of Education, but he said, I feel more comfortable if you had that authorization from your electorate. Because you're, you're crossing organizations. You're crossing actual organizations. So instead, we have to borrow, we have to borrow instead. Okay. Why does it have to be? But this is just this is a, a one time right now, and we're going to be voting it at, at this special meeting, like like a town meeting. Yeah. So I don't understand why it has to go, or am I confused in this? You're, you're saying it has to go through the ballot? No, we're we're voting right now. <laughs> you're going to be voting on Tuesday night. Yeah. Whoever shows up from the electorate on those things on Tuesday, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's the only one time, but. These are a lot of, almost this whole warning is one-time pieces. But it's confusing because we haven't set up school districts in many, many years. So we're having to do the initial work that I don't think anybody really remembers having done. I know Scott Thompson did some research into the formation of the Union 32 district and look at some of that. But you know, it's, it's those, and some of those pieces 
new legal law has come in to require us to do that work. So it's just it's just that it's, it's different. It's, it's a one-time thing for a lot of us. Um, and then any any more questions about that borrowing and authorizing to pay? Because that's that can be very confusing. And I'll look at the pursuant. That's a good word to check on. Thank you. The last part is the number eleven is determine whether to authorize the board of school directors pursuant. We've every year, and I don't want to read the rest of it, but every year we send out an annual report. I don't have a total of what that costs, uh, but we're up in the, I think, six to ten thousand dollar range of total cost. Um, and many districts have gone to mailing postcards home of where you can get the report online or call this number and we'll send you one. Um, and we're one of the last districts actually sending one out to every electorate. Um, and I would recommend that this be the way we do it if the, uh, to you and that the voters would, uh, would like to do it that way. You could decide, hey, we don't want to determine this meeting, we'd rather do it at another meeting. We'd like to table it or Reject it, that's fine too. It's just, it's the agency of education decided to put this on because I think so many folks are sending their, their you know, reports through sending a postcard out and saying, if you'd like to get a copy of the report, here's where it's online, or call and we'll send you one. And, or you can pick one up at town place. Because uh, as you just said, that whoever shows up, so whoever shows up gets to vote on how much we can borrow and the budget. Yep. Yeah, There's not a budget, but they get to authorize the the, 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 the borrowing. It's whoever shows up. Yeah, and that's I'm sorry, but is that legal? Yeah. Yes, system? it is. Yep. I'm going to show. Up. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 Vermont governance of Vermont town meeting. Whoever shows up. No, there is not a forum requirement. I can tell you, talking with Chris today, he said, I'll give you some anecdotal data. He said for the Champlain Valley or district organization, there were two people there, himself and his wife, outside of board members and elected officials that, uh, that needed to be there to run the meeting. The most he's seen, and he's barely been to 15 to 20 of these across the state to help out at the meeting, is in 55 at Westford. Like I said, you just doesn't see that many people showing up. I'm not saying I'm not saying that not to get people here. I'm just saying I'm trying to give some facts that I've been told. Anything more that I need to go more detail? Anything? Question? Really, just that uh, on the top of the morning it said it's February 19th, and then down it says Monday. So it was corrected when it was warned. I actually had the old one on my hard drive and I just printed it, not thinking this afternoon. Because Krista, being how great she is, caught that right before it was being posted and called the agency and said, can you put Tuesday on that? <laughs> and they fixed it. I still have the old one. Good, good catch. Curiosity: Since we have a large number of people in our district who have been vocal opponents of Act 46, if people show up and vote against these things, then what do we do? I, I would change that to not against. It's more of which way do you want to go? So if you don't have Australian ballot, you're staying with a four. If you don't allow for borrowing, we're not going to be able to pay bills. If we don't have, um, and so that will just slow down the development of the district to the point where we're going to be in debt in some places. I don't think it's going to stop it. I think it's just I, I would have to get with a financial expert on that one. 
Yeah, no, no, I know. I think it's a good question. I think it's a really fair question. I think it, it's a great question because that that's part of what I was asking Chris Leopold was like, so tell me where the pinch points are in this. What if this doesn't go through, or what if this doesn't happen? He said, well, your electorate's spoken. You know, and, and he said you'll deal with that when you get there. Okay. <laughs> I, I kind of actually like that attitude. Less worrying about it. Like you get, get there when you get there. I would also just say, and I really can correct me if I'm wrong, but but these article or these uh, items are actually listed. I think it's in 706 and so like we can't we can't, for example, somebody couldn't uh, vote to from the floor to remove number three from the agenda, for example, because it's required by statute that we that actually take it up. I think so, but I just I haven't gotten into that deep detail because. This was prepared. It was the responsibility of the Agency of Education to, to publish the warning. It was our job to post it. And I'm pretty sure that the statute that explains how a new school district forms literally lists word for word like the items that have to be warned on the first organizational meeting. Yeah, I think so. I'm guessing it was the same thing question about them being amended. I think it'd be important for there to be kind of ground rules or expectations laid out at the start of the meeting about how people can respond to these. Uh, because it sounds like they can't be altered in any, any way, shape, or form other than to, to, to vote them up or down, I guess. Uh, is that? I can't, I can't, I can't say that. Chris, Chris is right, you're gonna to go to Robert's rules. And that's what, the first thing we're gonna do, and I, I, I was willing to be the secretary's uh, agent there for the meeting to get it started, so I'm gonna go through I, to Article 1, and I wanna get an experienced moderator up there to run the meeting. No, that's not me. So they can't be amended. Yeah, I mean, we're gonna be just like a town meeting. What is the school meeting? Anybody? If, so right now, for voting on a budget and a school meeting are two different questions. All six schools have a school meeting on town meeting day because there are certain things that must be voted on to keep the operation of the school districts going because of the operational mode. So, there's articles for U32, they happen to be the clerk, the treasurer, treasurer, and that's it. Um, and then Callis and Berlin have decided to present their budget. So they, they're adding their budget on the local meeting. I don't know what that's gonna do. I, I kind of, as I said earlier, I'm like, okay, we'll deal with those issues when we get there. Oh, so Worcester is the, uh, Worcester, no one has that. We went to an Australian ballot two years ago, three years ago in Worcester? No, we have four. No, you we still have a floor meeting in Worcester for the local school district. But for the budget? Yes, we have yeah. a moderator who is the budget, budget. yeah. We do, we vote on the budget for the floor. Callis, that's right. okay. So then, sorry. So I'm thinking those are the folks who would have the experience in this type of meeting. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so just so they, I mean, what well, we'd ask the moderator who does it every year in Worcester if he would be willing to serve. And again, we're not using his name because we're trying not to. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> thanks, thanks, Alan. <laughs> we're we're uh, purposely trying not to use his name because he hasn't confirmed yet that he will uh, do this for us. But, uh, but that is the person we've asked him because he's, he does it every year and he's got a lot of experience uh, with it and runs a tight meeting, I think, from having a Are there any other questions about the organizational meeting? It is next Tuesday at six. What? Six days. Um, and I think, as I said at the outset, and for people who weren't here uh, when this was said, 
essentially, you know, we're under a legal order to, to do this. There are things that could change that. I, uh, I think most people are aware that the House passed a bill that would change the deadlines for Washington Central. I, I don't believe there's time at this point for the Senate to take it up and pass it and have it signed by the governor before this meeting would, would happen. Um, there's also, of course, the pending um, court case where there's a hearing on Friday and you know a judge could issue a stay or an injunction or some other kind of delay uh, which would affect the timing of this meeting potentially. Um, but absent one of those two things happening, this, this meeting will take place next Tuesday at 6. Can I add one other thing that I sent out today? Um, I haven't sent it to all of you. you um, we'll get it out to you. Uh, but I did um, make an announcement on Front Porch Forum. The executive committee in January, I talked to them about this earlier tonight in our executive committee meeting. They suggested that we start getting out information earlier on how you can uh, be nominated to be on the ballot for a new unified union school district board member. So today we published a fact sheet that's up on Act 46 and posted on all five towns from Porch Forums. People can start gathering names before the 19th. Um, you need 1% of your electorate. No one needs, we don't have a town large enough to hit the 30 limit. Um, but you must be a resident of your town and you must have signatures from your town, even though you'll be voted on by all five towns. And uh, those will be due if on the 19th, the annual meeting set on April 2nd, you will need that to be in by February 25th. I put those on there as temporary dates. Um, after we discuss that executive committee, um, we'll do more of that. I plan to do one of my videos again this Friday, kind of doing the same thing I just did with all of you, going through these articles for anybody that wants to be able to watch that ahead of time before they get to the meeting. So, um, I on that fact sheet shows the terms for each town for the two positions. It shows how you. It tells about. There's a generic petition sheet that you can use for any town office. Um, it's on the Secretary of State's website and your town clerks have those. Um, and you can also, if you have, if you need the link, let me know, I can send it to you as well. Um, and it talked about how the votes are voted in all five towns. Everyone's elected, so if you're running as an East Montpelier rep, you'll be voted in all five towns to that position. And you said six days after the meeting, those are due? Yes, it's very quick, because we're trying to get to, the idea is we're trying to get to a budget vote by mid, mid-May, so we're looking 60, we're looking 65 to 70 days out, because you have a 30 to 40 day warning period. The warning has to be up. And that's what we, I've gone through the timelines I sent you, that's why they're so tight. And it's not just, be, the reason for the mid-May is thinking if there, I hope there isn't, and we have a very good record in Washington Central budgets, but if the budget were to be lost for the merged district, we'd still have one more chance before we get to June 30th, and if we don't have a budget on June 30th, we have authority to spend 87.5% of this year's budget for next year until a budget is approved by the voters. It's, that's why the timeline, I, I've shown that before, I didn't bring that to me. But. Thanks, Bill. Are there any other questions or comments on this topic before we move to the next item on our agenda? Laura. As far as the organizational meeting, we're gonna have the part from moderator. Uh, are, how are we going to start this meeting? Are we going to give some background of where we are, depending on what is going on in the state? How, how, you know, how are we going to run the meeting, or is this purely business and the moderator? Because there's going to be people that are not really informed, not, not informed, but we want to have an update at least. There's a little background so that they're better able to answer the questions that we need before them. I don't know. All I can say is that it's not our job to run that meeting. Um, so actually we have no authority or standing to, um, at the beginning of the meeting, you know, get up and start to talk about the situation or the background or the context or, you know, 
we, someone could make a motion to add an item to the agenda, you know, maybe just background discussion or something, and, and if that motion carries, it would get added to the agenda, and then, you know, someone could stand and, and speak to that. Um, but we can't, you know, the, this board and, and these board members um, can show up to the meeting and participate in it from the floor, just like it, all other voters, um, but that's really our only and in my operation, uh, and working with Chris Leopold today, he was, and I agree with this sentiment, that especially because I'm the superintendent, and I'm opening the meeting, and I'm the agent from the secretary, my job is to open the meeting. If I will ask the floor if they'd like me to read the whole warning. Some places do that, some places don't. And if they do, I'll read it. Otherwise, I'll go right to item one and get a temporary moderator Obviously, the reading meeting is warned, but there are people who don't look at this kind of technical warning and might appreciate a narrative type comment on the government forum explaining what's happening, where we are in the process, what this means for the community. Okay, if there's nothing else on this, we can move to uh, 3.2 priorities. Uh, so I guess I will just say, just uh, for everyone's reference, that the, the three uh, goals that the SU Board adopted on December 5th were subsequently adopted by all six of the district boards as well. So just to recap very briefly, uh, we essentially endorsed uh, the, the math goal that the leadership team and the staff had already uh, put together and were working on for a similar goal in the area of literacy, and then we had asked that uh, there be a review and analysis of that data and the process, the goal setting process at the end of the, the school year. Uh, we had talked about um, a fourth recommendation from the School Quality Committee, which was to uh, possibly look for a way to develop a longer term, maybe three to five year plan for uh, ways that we could support improving uh, student learning outcomes. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to see exactly what's gonna happen in the next few months, but if the timeline uh, that the state board has put in place in its plan um, uh, continues to be in effect, uh, I think the next few months are gonna be quite consumed with governance and administrative issues related to Consolidation, so it doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense to try to dedicate a lot of time to in-depth conversations about, you know, a long-term plan until we see what happens with that process and where it goes. Um, I'll also just note um, here that um, the executive committee received a, a kind of question or took up a, a question at its last meeting about some committees like the school quality committee, like the policy who were curious about whether it really made sense for them to be aggressively tackling their work in the areas of policy or educational priorities, um, given the backdrop of, you know, kind of confusion and changing and, um, you know, administrative work that needs to be done, uh, with, again, with regard to this timeline. Um, and so the executive committee basically, um, you know, said that we don't, you know, committees can meet at their discretion Bill, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add on this discussion topic. Not really. I, I do want to assure you that one of the things that I have to really thank my team is um, that they're doing a great job of running the schools and moving things forward and making things better every day. Um, it's one of the 
strategies that we've talked about as a team is that um, that BRAC 46, it's not something that should be affecting their work and impacting their work with kids, families, and children, that they should be focusing on that and the central office will take up the, the Act 46 work. So uh, first of all, I want to thank them for that. I also know that we did a data review this past month and um, we're seeing some, some glimmers of hope uh, and movement in the data. Uh, we'll hopefully see some more. But all our measures that we use are what's called a progressive assessment. So it expects kids to learn. It's not like it's a baseline and then kids learn, but the, the, the target moves with the kids during the year. So, um, and they're doing great work doing that. So while it may be something that we're a little concerned with boards and superintendents, uh, they're, they're working on making it better every day for every kid. So. Thanks. Any questions or comments about uh, the educational priorities topic? Uh, hearing none, we'll go to 3.3 negotiations. Uh, who's, uh, so, in a moment of transparent communication, I believe this is on the discussion agenda in case it required discussion. But because we were able to come to tentative agreement on Monday, this is actually a report. I'm not, I don't think there's any discussion that's needed, but certainly we all can disagree. Um, the negotiations committee met three times in the last three weeks, and we were able to come to a tentative agreement through the interest-based bargaining consensus process on Monday. We agreed to narrow the scope of our work to health care and compensation and table the other issues that we had identified. Because, um, because the state is going to be taking over negotiating a statewide health care agreement, this contract could only be a one-year contract. And we somebody will be back at the table negotiating um, again, starting in the fall. And so while we, we all made um, kind of an informal commitment to really dig into some of the issues in the next cycle, we agreed to table them all. We were able to come to agreement on a healthcare package and um, a, a compensation that included an, an increase for the staff. And so the next step is for that to get drafted into contract language by the attorney and then go to the associations for ratification and the boards. And um, the ESP negotiations have, um, will be, will use the same healthcare package that was negotiated through the process we just went through. The ESP negotiators joined us for that part and then their, the ESP negotiations will take up compensation and potentially other issues. Questions? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and thanks to all the board members who worked on that. It was a very good process. Kari? Can you say what the percent increase is next year? Not yet. We're going to wait until the ratification process. I generally accept it. Generally accepted in Vermont that you don't release those until the ratifications happen, to allow the, the, both the board and the association have a chance to weigh in on what their representatives negotiate. I would also just like to second Johnny's comments, thanking not only the board members, but also Bill and anyone else in the room serving on the negotiations. Lori. Lori. Lori, yes. Um, it is an extraordinary commitment of time and last few years have been, at least from my perspective, very smooth and, and uh, cordial, I think, among all the parties. Um, so just really appreciate the hard work that goes into that. Um, yeah. Yeah, can, I say, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Actually, I should have said this before. Um, thank you for saying that and 
we really do owe a great debt to both Bill and Lori for the work that they do to get um, to make it possible for us to engage in the negotiations process in the way that we do, and um, especially for using the IBB process for it to be very transparent so that people in the room actually feel that they understand the, these very, very complex technical matters that we're trying to sort out around healthcare and how different options that we're considering would play out for different um, staff members depending on their family situations where they are in their careers and so So thank you very much. Any other comments or questions on negotiations? <coughs> so we'll go to 4.1, the executive committee report. Um, so just briefly, I've already mentioned a discussion we had about um, you know, committees and uh, you know, their scheduling over the next few months. Also, uh, at our last executive committee meeting, accepted uh, the audit, which I think everyone was, should have received uh, by email, um, and which, you know, again, uh, was passed with flying colors, no findings. And um, again, we'll thank Lori uh, and her team for just the extraordinary work that goes into that every year. Bill already mentioned that we did discuss also, you know, trying to get information out to communities about how to gather signatures and just the fact that there is potentially a new unified union district board that will come online and how to, you know, put their uh, their name on a ballot for that if they would like to do that. Uh, that was pretty much the substance of the last executive committee we had. Um, so if there are no questions about that, we can go to the financial reports. All right, so on page 12 of the packet, you will see the beginning of the financial report. Give me a second to get there. All right. Um, page 12 summarizes the entire SU and um, the revenues and expenses by each school district and the supervisor union. And down at the bottom, it shows you a summary of the fund balances throughout the supervisory union. Um, from pages 13 on, at your individual board meetings, you will see um, that in the month of January, we spent a considerable amount of time going through each line item and updating a projection for how we think we're gonna end the year. Um, under the revenues, a common theme is that most everyone will see there's an ad additional interest income this year. It's because we had a better interest rate on our investments, as well as um, the way that we're currently not spending money. Thank you to the principal. Um, you'll also see under the revenues a variety of things, so I'm just gonna give you a summary. So for instance, at U32, you'll see the tuition income is forecasted to be up, greater than budget, based on a larger number of students. You will see changes in special education income based on our staffing at the schools. You will see in some of the schools an item called miscellaneous income for shared benefits, and I wanted to take a second and tell you about that. Um, Callis and East Montpelier share a considerable number of staff, and so does Romney and Doty. And so what happens is the school that the person works um, pays for the benefits. Um, so if they work like 0.6 at one school and 0.4 at the other, the school that has the greater FTE will pay the benefits and they will receive revenue of equal proportions from the other school. So those are items that we don't double budget for, we budget for at each school, but the school that has the person and their benefits will actually see this month an increase in revenues and in expenses for that shared benefit arrangement. Um, I went through each employee who has a contract and we updated every employee's contract and their benefits to reflect um, their current health status as of January. So you'll see changes for um, payroll. You'll also see, um, let's see what else Oh, some of the school boards have uh, voted to transfer fund balances to the capital fund. So this month you'll see that update. I think there was three of you. 
And last but not least, we had some good news. Callis and Worcester received small schools grants greater than what we had budgeted. So you will see those notes in your financial. And I think utilities in some schools you will see um, that we're forecasting a savings. Um, we haven't finished updating that for the year because the plowing, salting, and sanding obviously are probably going to surprise us. Um, last but not least, um, next month at Washington Central, we'll be doing a complete special ed update. Um, we have a state report due in March, and so that involves going through every student and every program cost for students on IEPs, and that is something you can look forward to in March. Too much, too little? Questions or comments on the financial report? Thanks, Lori. I don't believe that the policy committee or the school quality committee have met recently. Okay. So that would take us to uh, the SBA. Or happening as we speak, so we usually meet on the second uh, Wednesday. So I'll update you in today's, uh, uh, today's meeting and a couple of questions. I got an email from Doc, so I also wanted to update you on that. I, I think the most important thing uh, today is that the, uh, the committee that was working on the report for ratios finished their work. I don't know if you read that on the Vermont figure, and they're recommending that no action is taken, but basically, have given some recommendations for the ta from this task force that uh, the thresholds or benchmarks to evaluate staff to student ratios won't be uh, touched. Uh, they don't have enough information right now to make um, to to make a good uh, comparison between the SUs. So all that they have right now is uh, is a guidance. So there's no action being. The next, the, the next important thing is that there has been some back and forth on uh, the BSBA response to the delay or not delay with the question uh, that passed on February 7th at the State House, the House passed that bill that uh, Matt was talking about. And we had given very clear guidance to Nicole, who's our executive director, and I, you know, we feel, and I'm talking to you, Dot, too. I, I feel like she, our guidance was to not, a, we are a diverse group of people, from people on both the sides of the issue, was to inform the conversation, but to not take a position. The question now before us has changed a, a little because they're talking about delay or not delay, and the Senate is not sure exactly when they're gonna take this question. But I just want you all to feel like, you know, we have your best interest, it's in your behalf, what, uh, as, a, as a group, I am a minority of the groups that hasn't uh, merged, has not merged uh, yet too, so it's, it's very diverse. The conversations are, are rich and are not always agreeable. So we asked Nicole to walk a, you know, a very thin line and I felt like she represented us, uh, represented as well, and that I'm not trying to you know, defend her, or I, I'm just saying we gave her clear guidance, and and she did what she could, and we want the information, her testimony, to always inform the conversation of what the consequence could be for e either side not to take a position. So tonight they are talking about if, if they should, and I don't know what the response would be, if the VSBA should take a position or not take a position on on, on the on the delay, and from my point of view, not representing necessarily you guys, I just, we talked about it at our executive session this afternoon, was that, you know, we just have to be equitable to to all, that I in any way want to feel like they're giving us a pass or anybody a pass, because there's very different situations around the, around the state, so that whatever they decide to do, that, 
their only recommendation, hopefully, when they testify is that the guidance is clear. So it doesn't create more, we have enough confusion as it is with the lawsuit and, and, and now this action by the, by the, the house that Senate has to take in. I, I feel that we have some, some um, it, we have this lawsuit going on, we should let that process go through and then have them decide something. But that's my personal point of view. I don't know exactly what will happen. I have, Brian, I have a question about, in the, the, we fund the Vermont School Boards Association dues like, through this, for the, through the superintendent's office, I believe, but not through the individual schools. They have not represented us very well in the past years, in my opinion. And personally, I would not, I would not be a member as a town accountant, so I wouldn't pay my dues, and I feel like we're forced. I actually want to know about how that decision was made, because it has not always been that were spent were paid by the individual schools and I think those schools should have to be able to retain that power because it's a way of voicing misrepresentation which we have seen with BSBA and you know I take personal offense that Callis is forced to pay dues to that organization through through our supervisory union because Callis is not represented by so I'm, I'm happy to bring your input to our meeting since this is not a meeting of the PSBA. I can't respond for entire PSBA. I do want to say that I hope that I, when I hear your comment from my point of view, it's a very narrow uh, perspective because if anything, I, you might be disagreeing with 5% of what the PSBA does, but the PSBA does more than just do uh, testimony state house so there's a lot of services that the BSBA provides to us and all over all over the state and, and we benefit of it we benefit of webinars we benefit of you know many other things so it might just be that five percent so I hope that you can keep an open mind but I will bring your input back to it, our it board should, the BSBA shouldn't be making that fiscal decision this should be made in this room and by the town themselves and frankly, I don't care if it's 5%, that 5% uh, may be. We need to get Jim Lane because we can't hear that. That very, I mean, that 5% may not be of significant significance to you, but of great significance to us. And frankly, that is our taxpayer dollars being used in a way that we don't necessarily feel is in our interest. So, well, my original question was how is that decision made that this body or the town body is not control their portion of that dues and we do not really care about that membership piece you know as far as yeah they do do some but they've done great damage as well and so well, why don't we have that voice and i know that may that could be a moot kind of you know point with force consolidation but this is bothersome to me you know, that, that we don't we're forced to participate an organization that is supposed to represent us, but in fact, it's not often. So I, I would just suggest that uh, unless there's a burning desire to take this up at tonight's meeting, it's not on the agenda, but we could add it as an agenda item to our, you know, to a future meeting, something that you would like to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see on page 35 there, there are reports. Um, I, I submitted one to all of you late January because there's changing uh, financial information on equalized pupils, on small school grants, um, and where we were with the Washington Unified Union work, uh, and also a memo on that as well. Uh, and there are reports in there from each principal along with the director's report. Questions? 
Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the social emotional learning professional development work, or if one of the if a member of the leadership team could. I was planning to ask this question in my local board meeting, but I thought if there's something, uh, maybe a brief example of how this is starting to change practice or something exciting or an opportunity around this that um, you wanted to share with the whole board, I, it would be great to hear that. I'm gonna ask Kelly to, to help to join us at first because she's been leading us, but I would ask her colleagues, principals as well, to talk about what they've seen in their building. So if no one stands up, I will probably draft somebody to come here with us. So over the last, um, I don't know, 18 months or so, um, we've had some professional development with Dave Melnick from NFI. Um, we've done some SU-wide in-service days. Um, he's leading a small group, we're calling it a catalyst group, some folks from across the SU that are taking on um, some leadership roles around learning about trauma-transformed practices. Um, they're starting to you know, make changes within their classrooms, within the work that they do in our schools. We're starting to look at student behavior and wonder you know, about what happened to that child and really um, dig deeper instead of seeing misbehavior as a kid just being naughty or being a brat. What, are, what else are they trying to communicate to us? Um, and to provide and to respond in different ways to um, help them get their needs met. We currently have a graduate level class that Dave is leading. Uh, we, um, last count, we have 18 folks that are signed up to do it. Um, we have, it's, you know, they've had one school day. The rest of it is weekends and evenings that teachers are volunteering to um, take some time to do. And um, it's, we're starting to see an impact in the behavior of students across the supervisory union. Okay, can you maybe talk to a minute about that, about the course that you're part yeah. of? Yeah, I'd be happy to. It, I, this has been such a rich opportunity to work with Dave. I started working with a cohort group that, um, was it last winter, last school year? Oh, the whole oh, last school year. And then again, it started up this fall and I started with the course um, with Dave, Alicia and Amy have joined us as well. This is a, a heavy lift really for us to start examining what does tier one look like for instruction for a universal approach that is trauma informed. And it's really exciting, but it's also frustrating work. I think we're gonna have to sit with that discomfort for a little while because getting folks to think about, um, it's easy to see when there's a challenge in the building for any child, right? The, there's a naughty behavior, there's a gross behavior, there's a rude behavior. Um, but to get folks to stop and reframe their thinking around um, this comes from a place of worry or pain or stress or anxiety, it changes the adult response. So instead of the adult coming out a problem with, what are you gonna do to that kid? Like, what's the consequence? It's, it, it sort of, it opens that door uh, for letting that kid's pain sort of be felt and heard and shared and then work through. And it's kind of beautiful, man, to see. Um, <laughs> It, we've got a long road ahead of us, but we're starting by um, looking as a leadership team at examining our own practices and how that might be um, both top down and bottom up, because we have a lot of great folks who work sort of bottom up, the paraeducators, the DI, the behavior coaches who are working with kids who already struggle. Um, so they have this movement of a trauma-informed approach from you know day to day, face-to-face in -face interactions. Um, and it's, it's, tri it's trickling into our classrooms. Um, I see a lot of folks who've been in education for a long time, struggling a little bit with how to go from that's naughty or misbehavior to how can I support this kid who's struggling? And they're working through it. And it's a, it's a really great thing to be a part of. I appreciate the opportunity to um, have this be brought to Washington. I'm really proud of this work. I also think that it's pushing us to rethink our comprehensive discipline plan, our approach to discipline. We're so great at talking about how to support learners in whatever way they need us to be and meet them where they're at when we're talking about math or literacy. I know we got work to do on math, but we're there, we're getting there. But this is us starting it in the social emotional learning realm and it's, it's great. I keep saying it's great or it's beautiful, but it really is. So 
They're all doing this, not it. <laughs> your questions? Any questions? Thank you. Does that answer your question, John? Thanks, John. That's yeah. great. Great to have this discussion. So, you know, I, I really want to thank Kelly. She's been spearheading this and, uh, and bringing it to the team. And uh, she's worked closely with Dave for years. So, been a real champion of this for us. Any other questions about the uh, helm? Bill, I, I wanted to ask about a story BT Digger ran on Monday concerning Title I funds. Are you familiar with that situation? I haven't read the story. You can ask and you can Well, this might, this gets pretty in the weeds really quickly, and I, I don't want to do that, but basically it involves the, prob the ongoing problem the education agency has had retrieving data specific to a school because Title I funds are supposedly to go to those schools who most need the help for kids who are behind. And the fact Vermont cannot produce the specific data that's needed to identify those schools, the state agency is now planning to spread Title I funds throughout all schools. which causes a problem for the next year because if you start, if you really need to have programs for needy kids and you're not getting the Title I funds you expected to, you're getting a small sliver that everybody is getting, and you start spending local funds to fill the gap, it means the next year if your federal funds come back, you can't use the federal funds to supplant what you had started using local funds to cover. So there's that problem, and I, my first question was, are we impacted by that in any way, shape, or form? But it sounds like this is a, something that's evolving. The second question I had, how is all this going to work when we're a unified district, if, if we indeed are? How, some schools in our district have much higher levels of poverty and, and numbers of new kids. Who's going to decide how the Title I funds are targeted? So because of the size of our supervisory union, we already do that, and we have been doing it. There's a, a, a formulaic approach called targeting and ranking, and when you have more than a certain number of kids in your supervisory union, you have to target and rank. So we use our free and reduced lunch data to determine the poverty. And then it's a really a formula based on the population in your school and the poverty rate. So that the school with the highest FRL rate gets the highest per pupil expenditure. So we already do it. It would not impact us. We continue doing it. Just to be a little clear for Alan, the federal <laughs> law requires you to school level, not at the district level. For Title I. Yeah. So if we were in another state, urban, suburban, multiple schools, um, you still have to allocate, even though it's one district, could be, you know, in the city of Rochester, New York, 100,000, you've got to do it by school because there's different socioeconomic levels in different schools. I thought it was on the LEA level, but that's no, not correct. No, it's not correct for Title I. Not for Title I. At school level. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments on the administrative report? Thank you. Uh, we're through our action agenda. We have one future agenda item. Is there any other future agenda items that uh, people would like to add now? Um, I just wanted to say briefly, this is not a business matter, it's more of a personal one. Um, and I debated whether or not to bring it up, but uh, at our December meeting we spent some time talking about how we all belong to each other. So I just want to note for people, many of you may be aware of this, um, but Woden Ticha, who left the rugby board a couple of weeks ago uh, to go to Romania uh, on a Fulbright scholarship with several of our children, 
lost her home here in Vermont on Saturday night to, to fire. And luckily her partner and two children who were there are safe and unharmed, um, but the loss was near total. So it's obviously an incredible upheaval for their family, uh, and especially for Woden being out of the country uh, while this is happening. Um, so their family's fine, but I just wanted to let people know if you wanted to reach out and say a few words of support or kindness, I'm sure it would be appreciated. Um, is there any board communication? Yes. The front porch forum in Middlesex on Monday had a posting about the fire, and it has a link to a meal train that has comments about, it now has like three different comments, one from Walton. It also provides an opportunity to provide money um, to donate, and they've already raised an incredible amount of money. And her comment, maybe yesterday, she's absolutely overwhelmed with the response that she's gotten from the community. She said it's more overwhelming than the actual fire. And she's thrilled to be part of this community. That's awesome, thanks for sharing. Thanks. So if there's uh, no other business to come before the board, I it just add something. Mark Chaplin is raising money for Waylon to be able to to win, of course, sorry for Jed to be able to go. He's working incredibly hard this year, and they're trying to raise seven hundred dollars. The entire team, I think, we almost raised it already, but it's fine. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thanks, okay. Now, if there are no other board comments, then. We'll take this opportunity to shockingly end our meeting six minutes early, uh, which I'm very grateful for. Um, so without objection, we're adjourned at 6.15.